he posted on he posted this on his All right, hello everybody, we're gonna get started. So today's our joint CE presentation. So I'll be going first and then Dana will be going second and Larray will be going third. So hello everybody, today I'm gonna to be presenting my research project from this year titled Microbial Trends in Neutropenic and Non-Neutropenic Patients Admitted to a Tertiary Care Hospital. So my research team acknowledgement, I would like to acknowledge my PI, Dr. Roderick Goh, Dr. De Jesus, Dr. Hertz, Dr. Satia, and Dr. Raman for all their help with this project. And as for disclosures, we have nothing to disclose. And our learning objectives today, we're going to discover the common pathogens cultured in neutropenic and non-neutropenic oncology patients admitted to a tertiary care hospital and recognize the distribution of antimicrobial resistance among the pathogens isolated in those patients. So just as a background on cancer and infection, patients with cancer at an increased risk of infection, which even further increases their risk of mor morbidity and mortality. Neutropenia is recognized as a major risk factor for acquiring an infection. In febrile neutropenia, this definition is the definition used by the NCCN guidelines so for fever, it's defined as a single temperature equivalent to 38.3 degrees Celsius or higher orally, or equivalent to 38 degrees Celsius or higher orally over a one hour period. Neutropenia is defined as 500 or less neutrophils or 1000 or less with a predicted decline to 500 or less over the next 48 hours. So as for the currently available guidelines in 2010, the IDSA or Infectious Diseases Society of America issued the use of antimicrobial agents in neutropenic patients with cancer. So that guideline actually updated and expanded the initial IDSA fever and neutropenia guideline that was first published in 1997. And then in 2018, IDSA joined forces with ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and they released the guidelines regarding antimicrobial prophylaxis. And then in 2022, our most recently updated guideline is from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or NCCN, regarding prevention and treatment of cancer-related infections. Now, these guidelines recommend for bacterial prophylaxis to consider it during periods of neutropenia for patients with intermediate or high overall risk of infection. So that would be with fluoroquinolones such as ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin. And then typical inpatient IV empiric treatment is monotherapy with an anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam. Now, the purpose of this project is really to drive our own practice here at Stony Brook. So we're going to be evaluating the organisms that patients acquire in the community to help guide our empiric treatment here when they present to the hospital. So currently here, cefepime is our first line antibiotic for febrile neutropenia, but with increasing rates of antimicrobial resistance and in such a vulnerable population, we're trying to see if this is the right approach for this uh, population at our institution. Now our study objectives, our primary objectives are to determine the distribution of pathogens isolated from cultures in neutropenic and non-neutropenic oncology patients. Our secondary objectives are to determine the distribution of antimicrobial resistance among those pathogens. And then we also wanted to look at mortality rates during the current hospital admission. For our methods, this is a single center retrospective chart review where we utilized PowerChart to access patient charts and perform our data collection. So we utilize the NCCN definition for febrile neutropenia, which is listed here. And then we recorded our resistance as nominal data, so either yes or no. So we looked for extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing or ESBL, fluoroquinolone resistant organisms, cefepime resistant organisms, carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis or CRE, vancomycin resistant enterococcus or VRE, and methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSI. So our inclusion criteria, we included any patient that was admitted to the Leukemia, Lymphoma, and Bone Marrow Transplant Service, or LLT, as we refer to it here. 
who were receiving ongoing treatment for malignancy within the last six months and had a bacterial culture performed within 48 hours of admission. They also needed to be 18 years of age or older. And then we excluded anybody under the age of 18. And then for patients with multiple admissions, any subsequent admissions within 30 days were excluded from our study. This was because um, if a patient may have been discharged and was growing an organism at their previous admission, it may not have fully cleared and they may have been um, still growing it. So it may not have been accurate of what patients are acquiring in the community. And our study period was from July 1st of 2020 to June 30th of 2022. For our statistical analysis, we utilized descriptive statistics to analyze our primary and secondary outcomes. And for our baseline characteristics, we had a total of 78 patients. And of those 78 patients, there were 92 admissions with a total of 178 cultures taken. The average length of stay was about 16 and a half days. And the mean age of our patients was about 60 years old. There was a fairly even number of males and females included within this study. And there were a small number of patients who had renal impairment and hepatic impairment. Now for my results. For oncology diagnosis, out of 78 patients, just under half of the patients had leukemia, with AML being the most common leukemia seen. And then about 30% of patients had lymphomas, with the majority of them being a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then about 21% of patients had myeloma. It's also important to note some of the other categories, such as aplastic anemia, IgG4, lymphadenopathy, and MDS that some of our patients had. Now, out of the 92 admissions, the majority of patients were non-neutropenic. So there were 70 patients that were non-neutropenic and 22 patients that were neutropenic. And out of those 22 patients that were neutropenic, the majority of them were actually not receiving bacterial prophylaxis with ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin or an alternative agent. And out of the total 178 cultures, the majority of these cultures were negative. And to break it down further into neutropenic versus non-neutropenic, out of the neutropenic cultures, there was a total of 47 taken, and the majority of them were negative. But of the positive ones, the most common source was blood, followed by urine, and then other cultures such as skin and wound cultures were also included. For our non-neutropenic patients, um, there's a total of 134 cultures, but the more majority of them also being negative. But of the positive, similarly, the most common source was blood cultures, followed by urine cultures, and then other cultures such as pleural fluid, sputum, stool, and wound cultures. So this graph is just showing you all of the organisms that were isolated in these patients. So the red bars are going to be our non-neutropenic patients and the blue bar is our neutropenic patients. So coagulase negative staph was actually most common in both groups. And then Escherichia coli was actually the second most common in both groups. So some other organisms I did want to point out were Pseudomonas aeruginosa. There was one culture in each group. Plebsiella pneumoniae, there were four cultures in um, the non-neutropenic group and zero in the neutropenic group. And Acinetobacter baumani, there was one culture isolated in each group. Now, as for resistance rates, something that was very interesting was that there were actually no CRE, BRE, or MRSA isolated in either group. Now, going through the neutropenic section of the cultures that could be resistant to fluoroquinolones, actually 83% of them were. And then of the cultures that could be resistant to cefepime, 43% 40 of them were, which is a pretty high number. And then in the non-neutropenic group, there were much lower rates of resistance, but there was still a significant amount of resistance to fluoroquinolones at 45%. Now looking at mortality rates, four out of the 70, 78 patients, or about 5%, died during their admission. One of those patients was neutropenic and none of them were on antimicrobial prophylaxis. All of the four patients, or 100%, actually had a positive urine culture within 48 hours of admission, which was something pretty interesting. And then one of those patients also had a positive blood culture within 48 hours as well. The organisms isolated included Enterococcus faecalis. There were two isolates of Klebsiella, 
and then Staphylococcus epidermidis and E. coli as well. So two of the five organisms were resistant to fluoroquinolones, and then one of the five was resistant to cefepine. So of course, with this, though, there is some limitations because um, the accuracy of these mortality rates, since many times patients um, who are at the end of their life may be discharged um, on comfort care to hospice um, instead of actually passing away in the hospital. So these mortality rates may not be reflective of patients who have ultimately succumbed to their illness. And continuing on with some other limitations, one limitation was that we have a small sample size, so there really wasn't enough um, patients to do a power um, analysis. But the good news is we are continuing on data collection. So this is only two years of data, but we actually have IRB approval, approval for 10 years of data. So the Infectious Disease Fellow will be continuing this project into next year to get the other uh, remaining eight years of data to analyze that as well. It is also a single institution study, so it's not really sure if these results are generalizable to other hospitals and within the population across the world. Um, also, since it's a single institution study, we didn't see if a patient was admitted elsewhere and may have been transferred here. Um, we would have no idea and we wouldn't know um, for those patients. And then we also only studied patients admitted to the LLT unit. So um, we're not looking at all types of cancer, just these cancers. And we're also unable to see any patients who are maybe followed by the LLT service, but were admitted to other floors. Um, for example, with the medical ICU, if a patient's presenting with severe sepsis, maybe requiring pressors or intubation, they were admitted directly to MICU. We were unable to capture those patients, unfortunately. And then um, this was also a retrospective chart review, so there was no opportunity for pharmacist intervention. Um, we also only saw what was in the chart, so we're fully relying that the providers documented everything correctly, um, and we were only able to access what we saw. And for our conclusion, uh, the majority of pathogens isolated in both neutropenic and non-neutropenic patients were gram-positive, um, with coagulase negative staphylococcus being the most common bacteria isolated in both neutropenic and non-neutropenic patients. And then in both populations, there were ESBL, fluoroquinolone resistant, and cefepime resistant organisms identified. And then in this study, mortality occurred at a rate of 5% of patients. So thank you all so much for listening. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so if nobody has any questions, I'm gonna turn it over to Dana for her presentation. Thank you, everybody. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, so I'm up next. I'm going to be presenting on pharmacist identified drug induced mental status changes. As for disclaimers, I have nothing to disclose or any sort of conflicts of interest. And then as for acknowledgements, I just wanted to have a special thank you to Dr. Marie Varela and Dr. Michael Capuza. And so for today, I really only have two objectives to go over. The first one is discussing the value of having a pharmacist dedicated to identifying drug-induced delirium in the inpatient setting. And then the second one is listing some of the various etiologies of drug-induced altered mental status. So as for background, um, firstly, I sort of just wanted to define what delirium is. So delirium is an acutely disturbed state of mind that can result in confused thinking and reduced awareness of surroundings. Um, it can also be termed altered mental status as well as acute encephalopathy. And the pathophysiology for delirium, although it's mostly unknown, it's believed that it's associated with a decrease in acetylcholine and an increase in dopamine activity. 
So oftentimes in medical practice, it is due to medications, but most of the time it's multifactorial. So it's due to medications alongside infection, structural, metabolic, or environmental causes. And this is on top of an already vulnerable patient who's in the hospital. And as we all know, the longer a patient stays in the hospital, the more likely they are to become delirious just due to being in an unfamiliar environment and sort of not being in their usual routine. So I have this sort of grim acronym. It's called I Watch Death, um, but it is helpful to remember some of the ways in which um, delirium can occur. And so that can be due to your withdrawal or with um, CNS pathology, hypoxia, certain deficiencies, maybe a head trauma. But according to literature, the most common triggering factor of delirium is found to be um, infections in 49.5% of cases. And those are mostly due to urinary tract infections and lung infections. So as we know, pharmacists are uniquely poised to screen medications to determine whether certain reactions such as delirium are drug induced or not. We know that clinical pharmacists have many roles, which I have depicted in the photo. Um, so they can participate in rounds. Um, they can do clinical reviews. They help with monitoring ADRs. They do patient counseling. But really what I want to focus on is that clinical pharmacists can be helpful in the sense that our eyes are trained to notice a tricyclic antidepressant on a med rec or a steroid or a certain medication that possesses a degree of anticholinergic activity known to induce delirium, especially in the elderly. So a pharmacist's main role for this project would be switching to alternative medications or reducing drug doses where possible. So these are really um, some of the questions that I would ask myself or a pharmacist would ask themselves when screening a, a med rec for delirium. Um, these questions are in no particular order, but it's sort of helpful to have them all out there of just a way of figuring out what you wanna ask yourself when going through the medications. So firstly, it was when was the onset of the delirium? So has this patient been delirious for three months or did this just occur a couple of days ago? What other comorbidities does the patient have? So is the patient a diabetic? Are they potentially having a hypoglycemic crisis? Are they having any recent physiologic changes? So is the patient fluid overloaded? Are they severely dehydrated? We can check for drug interactions. We can see if the dose or frequency is appropriate for the patient. And then we can see how long the patient has been on the medication. So we can do that by looking into the med rec and the past fill history. So has this patient been on it for four years or did they just start it yesterday? So the main purpose of this research was that Stony Brook University Hospital Emergency Department physicians questioned if the addition of a pharmacist review would improve the identification of drug-induced mental status changes in patients presenting to the emergency department. And we really had one primary endpoint, and it was solely looking at if adding a pharmacist um, would help with potential earlier identification of delirium etiology. So as for our methods and study design, this was a prospective chart review of all inpatients older than 18 with the diagnosis of altered mental status, delirium or encephalopathy upon admission from September, 2022 to March of 2023. And essentially the way this project would work is anytime a physician would put in a diagnosis code for any of the, the words I mentioned before for altered mental status, delirium or encephalopathy, anytime they put in that code, I would get an alert sent to my phone, and then I would then be able to perform a um, med rec using our electronic medical record. And that med rec also consisted of looking at home medications, labs, cultures, emergency department notes, and psychiatry consultation notes if they were available. So this was, the, was within 24 hours of the alert, and most reviews were completed by a team of two pharmacists. So as for patient characteristics, of the 110 patients that were screened for drug-induced delirium, 61% were female, and the main age was 80 years old. So now looking at the causes of delirium, so I have them broken down into bars and the amount of patients in each category. So we have a UTI and worsening dementia, drug-related etiology. Miscellaneous was really a combination of any patient that had either anxiety or seizure, hepatic encephalopathy, a hypoglycemic crisis, there was a skip dialysis day or a patient with cancer. There was also worsening dementia, 
UTI and non-UTI infectious etiology. So the main one that I want to point out is the one in the red box, which is what we were discussing. So the drug-related etiology really only occurred in eight of the 110 patients, so around 7%. Um, another thing I wanted to draw your attention to is, um, interestingly, when compared to literature, as I had mentioned before, with the most common triggering factor of delirium being infection in 49.5% of cases, if we add the very last two bars in this um, chart, we get around 56%. So it's actually pretty similar to what the literature is saying. So this is the most interesting part of the research is that we had eight true cases of drug-induced delirium. And these were example um, of data that both pharmacists and the medical team believed that a medication was the root cause of the delirium. So as for the different causes, we have overdose, non-compliance, dehydration, and hyponatremia, withdrawal and dose titration, and then the amount of patients that experienced each. So as for overdose, we had two patients that had overdosed on oxycodone, and obviously the medication was discontinued to lead to their altered mental status resolution. We had one patient overdose on digoxin, and they were provided the antidote. For noncompliance, we had one patient um, who was noncompliant with their Keppra. They ended up getting switched to a cosamide inpatient, and then their pickup was confirmed on the PMP. We had one patient that had extremely high levels of lithium, so they were obviously discontinued on lithium while they were inpatient, and then they were restarted at a more appropriate dose outpatient. We had one patient on hydrochlorothiazide, which was experiencing dehydration, so that medication was discontinued. We had one patient withdrawing from quetiapine who had been on it longstanding. When they got to the hospital, they were not continued on it, so we had that medication reinstated, which resolved the altered mental status. And then lastly, we had one patient who was on several different medications and really required a psychiatry consult in order to help titrate those medications um, in a safe environment. So ultimately, what we realized is that the main key to identifying delirium before the medical team really boils down to quick and immediate access to the patient, which is why we have our wonderful decentralized pharmacists who are already at an advantage of being able to, at least within 24 hours, screen their incoming patients and therefore should likely have drug-induced delirium screening incorporated into their job roles. So our decentralized pharmacists are extremely valuable. Um, in looking back in a two-year period, our six decentralized pharmacists identified 56 adverse drug reactions involving 39 different drugs, according to the Stony Brook Hospital's clinical database. And then also if the decentralized pharmacist were to be assigned to the ED, the pharmacist would be able to conduct this study upon patient arrival. And obviously the benefit of that is these can be performed earlier and then it could be assessed. So in conclusion, due to the small number of cases and the fact that these were not identified by the team with, we were identified by the team without the aid of a pharmacist, it would not be advantageous to hire a pharmacist dedicated to identifying drug-induced delirium in the inpatient setting. Another thing was that the alert system that was used for this project sent alerts post-emergency room note. So I wasn't really getting these alerts in real time. I was actually getting all of the alerts in one um, email and that would be usually at 1 a.m. So I would be able to do it in 24 hours, but not directly when the patient was admitted. So definitely not being in the emergency department was a major limitation. But ultimately, even if a pharmacist does not identify drug-induced delirium before the medical team does, of course, it would still be valuable to have a pharmacist providing pertinent drug information. These are my references. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, if not, um, you definitely have my email. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Lorraine.
Hi everyone, I'm Lorraine and I'm going to be presenting my research on evaluation of fluoroquinolone use and incidence of QTC prolongation. Okay, I just want to thank Dr. Marie Varela for being my research mentor throughout the year and helping me with my project. And I have no financial disclosures. So first we're gonna talk about um, three objectives. So we're gonna discuss the, the role of fluoroquinolone use in regard to QT prolongation. We're gonna discuss the potential dangers of QT prolongation, and we're going to list some other medications that can cause QT prolongation. So some background on fluoroquinolone. So the mechanism of action is basically that they exhibit concentration dependent bactericidal activity by inhibiting the activity of DNA gyres and um, which are enzymes essential for bacterial DNA replication. So the spectrum of activity of fluoroquinolone is very broad. They're broad spectrum, so they're covering aerobic gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. So the most notable gram-positive coverage that fluoroquinolones have um, is Enterococcus faecalis. And in terms of gram-negative coverage, um, fluoroquinolones do cover Pseudomonas. So in terms of um, what the fluoroquinolones are indicated for or what they treat. Um, they are used for intra-abdominal infections, urinary tract infections, sinusitis, joint and bone infections, as well as ophthalmic infections. So as pharmacists, we're all very well aware of the warnings with fluoroquinolones. So they, they, they can cause C. diff infection, hepatotoxicity, you have the tendinitis that's well known. Um, and throughout this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on the QTC prolongation associated with fluoroquinolones. And the fluoroquinolones currently available in the U.S. include ciprofloxacin, gemifloxacin, levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, and olofloxacin. So what is the QT interval? So it's basically um, an interval on the ECG that represents the duration of ventricular action potential. So it has to do with ventricular depolarization and repolarization. So my picture on the right shows when um, the QRS complex is in depolarization versus repolarization. So this duration is largely dependent on closure and opening of ion channels. So it has to do with the influx of sodium and calcium causing depolarization and the efflux of potassium causing repolarization. So any disturbance in these ion channels will lead to an excess of these ions um, being influxed, and that will lead to a uh, prolongation or QT, QT prolongation. So what is QT, QT versus QTC? So due to the variation of QT interval with heart rate, it's really important to correct the QT interval for the heart rate. So that is called QTC or corrected QT interval. Um, so basically the higher the heart rate, the shorter the QT interval, the lower the heart rate. Um, the longer the QT interval. So just some more background on QT prolongation. So QTC is prolonged if it's greater than 450 milliseconds in men or greater than 470 in women. On the right, I have a picture just showing normal QTC borderline versus prolonged in males and females. A QTC greater than 500 milliseconds is associated with increased risk of torsades, which I will get into in a little bit. And some patients naturally have a long QT. This is known as long QT syndrome. So what are some risk factors for drug-induced QT prolongation? So some patients will just be at an increased risk of developing drug-induced QT prolongation if they're older than 65, if they're female, if they have rated cardio when they came in, on if they have electrolyte abnormalities like hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia, and hypocalcemia. And then some medications that can cause QT prolongation. So as pharmacists, we're very well aware of the antipsychotics like haloperidol, droperidol, ziprazidone, but then the antimicrobials like fluoroquinolones can cause QT prolongation as well as remacrolides. Um, and then amio, amiodarone is a big one as well as methadone. And then a medication that people don't usually think about when they think of QT prolongate prolongation is metronidazole. Metronidazole can also increase your QT. And a lot of my patients that I evaluated were on metronidazole and the fluoroquinolone. So now that we have a good background on QT and fluoroquinolones, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about torsade points. So it's basically a ventricular tachycardia that's characterized by oscill oscillatory changes on the ECG. 
So that's what it, this is what it looks like on the right. So in terms of management, we want to prevent the onset of torsades in every patient by targeting modifiable risk factors, such as de-escalating a patient's med profile if they have other QT prolonging drugs, and making sure to co correct a patient's electrolyte profile. So correcting their hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypocalcemia can all help to prevent the onset of torsades. If a patient is in torsades, you would want to treat them right away. So you would use magnesium one to two grams, IV push over 15 minutes, and that usually corrects the torsades right away. Um, but then again, we always want to try to manage and prevent the torsades from happening at all. So the purpose of my study was to characterize the occurrence of QTC prolongation in patients that were on fluoroquinolone therapy with or without other drugs that can cause QTC prolongation or in those with a pre-existing long QT syndrome so that it can be determined if a quality improvement plan is needed. And my primary objective was to characterize the occurrence of prolonged QTC interval in patients on fluoroquinolone therapy admitted, admitted to our institution. So my inclusion versus exclusion criteria, so I included patients that were 18 years or older and I included patients that received oral or IV fluoroquinolones as an inpatient between July and September of last year. I excluded patients that were under 18 that didn't receive any fluoroquinolones within the study time period, were ordered for fluoroquinolone but never got any doses, and patients that had a pacemaker. So my study design, it was a retrospective chart review and data was collected through the EMR called Parachart at our institution, and descriptive statistics were used to analyze the primary outcome. So jumping into my results, so I just have some baseline characteristics. So I analyzed a total of 598 patient profiles, and I included 300 patients. So with those 300 patients, um, the, there was an equal ratio of male to female, and the mean age was 62 years old. So just looking at fluoroquinolone usage at our institution, so it can be seen that we use ciprofloxacin more than levofloxacin, but in terms of formulation, we, we use IV piggyback the most for both of these medications. And then indications for fluoroquinolone use at Stony Brook. So um, the patients that I analyzed, the most common indication that the fluoroquinolones were being used for it with, with my 300 patients was the acute abdominal infection. So 96 out of 300 patients had an acute abdominal infection and were, be, were being treated by fluoroquinolones. The next common indication was UTI, and then the next common one after that was pneumonia. And then just looking at concomitant QT prolonging drugs that patients were on. So 116 out of 300 of my patients were not, were not on any QT prolonging drugs, but the most common drug that they were on if they were on a concomitant QT prolonging drug was metronidazole. So, and that kind of makes sense because the really go-to treatment for an intra-abdominal infection is metronidazole and fluoroquinolone. So a lot of my patients were on both. So just looking at uh, the QTC values that I collected. So I have two different analysis. So on this table, we're looking at um, patients that had an admission QTC of greater than or equal to 500 milliseconds. So before I jump into that, um, I just want to point out how 173 out of 300 patients had a baseline QTC to start with. So there was only 173 patients that had a charted baseline QTC that I looked at out of 300 patients. Out of those 173 patients, 24 of my patients um, had a QTC value that was greater than 500 milliseconds upon admission. And then in these 24 patients that had an admitting QTC greater than 500 milliseconds, three had an increase in QTC while they were on fluoroquinolone therapy. So the, the increase range was from 16 milliseconds to 32 milliseconds. Um, and then in 15 of these 24 patients, no other QTC values were charted besides the QTC upon admission. So in 15 of the 24 patients that had a QTC value greater than 500 milliseconds upon admission, I couldn't follow them throughout because I only had that initial baseline QTC value to work with. So I don't know if their QTC increased or decreased while they were on the fluoroquinolone therapy because none, nothing else was charted after their baseline QTC charted. And then on this table, we're looking at patients that did not have an admission QTC greater than or equal to 500 
So these patients were coming in with a more, a more normal QTC, and then their QTC increased when they were on the fluoroquinolone therapy. So there was, a 20, there was a total of 26 patients that did not have an admission QTC greater than or equal to 500 milliseconds. They had less, but then they had an increase in QTC while they were getting the fluoroquinolone therapy. So I divided the 26 patients into two groups, so patients with increase in QTC while on fluoroquinolone therapy alone, and no other QT prolonging meds. So that was 18 out of 300 patients. Patients with an increase in QTC while on fluoroquinolone therapy with other QT prolonging drugs, so that was eight patients. And then the, in, the average range increase in QTC while on therapy was two to 67 milliseconds. So patients that, these patients that had an increase, it could range from two milliseconds to 67 milliseconds. And 10 of my 26 patients had an increase in their QTC above 500 while they were on therapy. So they started off at a lower end um, QTC wise, and then it went all the way above 500 while they were on the fluoroquinolone therapy. So some limitations to discuss for my research. So it was a single institution study. So um, just talking about generalizability, I don't know what other institutions do in terms of charting QDC and just their fluoroquinolone usage. Um, this was a retrospective chart review. So again, I did have a lot of QDCs that were uh, not charted, so I couldn't really look at that. Um, so that was just something that's a limitation that comes about with retrospective chart review. I also didn't distinguish admission QTC as long QT syndrome versus drug-induced. So what that means is I didn't look at their QTC and think about, oh, like, do they actually have a high QTC at baseline because they have long QT syndrome? Or was this drug-induced from like a home med and they might have like taken like too many doses or um, they're just coming in because it's caused by a home med? And I also didn't check for re reasons that can cause bradycardia. So um, as, I, as we discussed before, bradycardia can lengthen the QTC interval. So um, patients that came in with a longer or like higher QTC, um, I didn't check to see if that was caused because they were bradycardic when they came in or were they on like beta blockers that can cause bradycardia. So I didn't dive too much deeper into charts and that's why these two are limitations. So in conclusions, providers order fluoroquinolones often without regard to QTC, which may, play, uh, which may place patients at risk of developing arrhythmia. And then concomitant QTC prolonging medications may further this risk. So it's worth discussing whether or not a baseline QT should be obtained on patients prior to starting drugs that can increase QT interval. If patients are on telemetry, uh, we should consider routine documentation of QTC for patients who are on telemetry. And then although no symptomatic arrhythmias were noted and interventions such as electronic provider alert may be warranted in efforts to prevent future harm. So if your doctor is trying to order a fluoroquinolone on patients that have a high QTC coming in, it would alert you and maybe have you reconsider your, your decision about ordering the fluoroquinolones or not. And these are my references and what questions do you have for me? Okay, if you guys don't have any questions, I can um, close the Zoom, right? Okay, thank you everyone for coming.